Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're watching this. Uh, Millie here from ESBR, uh, joined by my esteemed cohort, Owen. And we're here to preview the USIC Joshua undercard, um, which you can watch. Well, not, you can, not only can you watch the undercard, you can watch the main event, obviously live on Sky Sports Box Office. To purchase the event, um, go to the link in obviously our description, um, which obviously promises to be a fantastic evening. Um, obviously, the, the the main event, probably one of the one of the few top elite fights that we've got, obviously in 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 boxing this year. Um, so we've reviewed that uh, already. So yeah, check out check out our content on our channel for that one. But yeah, the uh, the undercard is finally announced, finally with us. Owen, can I just take your initial thoughts on uh, on the undercard collectively? Are you happy with it? Do you think it's satisfactory for an event of this size? Um, will you be tuning in? Um, definitely be tuning in. No doubt about that. Um, at first, when the undercard got announced, I was I was very disappointed. I thought for a fight of that magnitude to be holding it in Saudi Arabia. The money it's worth, um, in a sense, no one really knows if it's the zone or if it's the the promoter out there as well who's putting the money up for it. Bit of a weird one. Now the undercard's taken a bit of shape. It's improved. I'd have liked to have seen a bit more. This is it's not a make or break for the heavyweight division, but it's got serious, serious repercussions for the future of the heavyweight division, and everyone knows. The heavyweights are the kings of boxing. They're the ones most likely to bring the casual in um, to watch the sport. So it is a decent undercard, but I would have liked maybe at least one potential, maybe European fight, um, an IBF fight even, IBO, something like that. But we'll we'll see how it goes. We'll see. I, I totally agree with you, actually. It'd be nice to see you. Even like in a Coley or someone else on the undercard, yeah. just you know, an event of this size. But it's no um, disrespect to, to the undercard fighters. We obviously got a certain certain amount of time to to discuss this, so we're going to take three fights essentially. Um, I mean, obviously Ramlo Ali fights, Lapin fights, and then I was looking at a debut fight initially, which uh, I was confused. I actually thought it was Jose Altador, the former American <laughs> Fulham striker, was fighting, but it's not him. But anyhow, um. There's those three fights happening, and then obviously there's Tabiti versus Spong, which is also um, Tabiti obviously having a couple of uh, notable names in his record. But we're not going to start there. We're going to do Badu Jack, Philip Hergovic, and the Cameron Smith fight. So we're going to start with the Jack fight, who's uh, so yeah, he's obviously 26, 3 and 3, 38 years of old, 38 years of old, 38 years of age, and he's fighting Richard Riviera, uh, 31 years old, uh, from the US, guy who's six foot. And this is obviously a cruiserweight fight as well that's taking place here. Badu Jack recently has obviously made his name really, I suppose, fighting out in the Emirates, out in Dubai, at Abu Dhabi. Um, Owen, just get your thoughts really on this. Um, who you expect to win, I mean, first and foremost. And then depending on that answer, if the answer is Jack, I'm not saying that it is, I don't know if it is, we haven't spoken about it beforehand. If it is, I just want to get a, a summary really of where you think he can really go at 38 years of old, what's realistic for him. Um, it's a bit of a weird one because... Badu Jack obviously had the fights with the Gale. Um, you know, we, I think we've seen Badu Jack's better days. His last two opponents, he's probably made the most money he's ever made fighting out in Abu Dhabi and he fought nobody's really. Um, so you can't argue with him on that. Obviously, he's part of the money team, so it's probably Floyd saying to him, go and secure your bag. The money's there. Go and take it. Um I think that's the only reason he's fighting on, really. I don't see him winning titles anymore, um, especially I fought a light heavy and cruiser. I don't see him beating anyone of substance, um, in a sense, in either of those weights. Um, Riviera's unbeaten. He, I think he's around 21-0. and 0. Right. I had a look through his record. I've watched some of his fights back, mainly highlights. Um, again, he hasn't really fought anyone. So, to be honest, it's... I see it as a bit of a 50-50 fight, to be fair. He's, he's an unbeaten 21-0 fighter looking to get that first big name um, ex-world champion on his resume. So he's going to be keen. Obviously, Badu Jack isn't going to want to lose this on the biggest stage. Um, so I think experience likely will prevail with Jack. Um, but it'll be interesting to see Riviera. Um, I don't think many... British fans essentially will have seen much of him. Um, I'm sure our American counterparts will have. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll imagine towards Jack, it's likely an interesting fight. Anyone who's got an O on their record, for me, it's always interesting. Uh, whether they've been fighting journeyman, 
um, whether they've been fighting tin cans or whether they've been fighting the best domestic rivals or potential world title challengers. It's always interesting to see, you know, but personally, I'm going to go with Jack based off the... uh... Let me follow up with a question because I've been looking at the rankings and if you're looking at WBC rankings, Barry Jackson at seven, sandwiched between Billum Smith and Rick Bohr. If you look at the WBO, he's up, I think, ranked two in between Billum Smith and Kovalev. Now, obviously, Kovalev's seen, we've seen better days as well, but I was thinking, Barry Jack, 38, just for the British interest mainly, do you see him being competitive against the likes of Billum Smith or Rick Bohr now or do you reckon if he fought either of those guys... It would be it would be a, a big British victory. That's a very good question, actually. Um, I think React Paul probably blows him away. Um, whereas I think with Billum Smith, the, Billum Smith hasn't really had a fight where it hasn't been entertaining. Even the Isaac Chamberlain scorecards were quite wide. Um, you know, your one one seven, one elevens is realistically on paper that's that's a solid night's work, quite comfortable. Um, but it wasn't at all, especially the latter, the latter rounds were a bit of a dogfight at times. Um, so the Bill on Smith fight, I think I'd edge towards watching that over React Poor. It'd be brilliant for React Poor because I think he would personally, I think he'd just overpower him and bomb him out. Um, whereas Bill on Smith, I think again, it's a cliche, but um, Badu Jack's experience of the, the competitors he's been in with, I think he'd make that a really interesting fight. Um, and again, obviously, that's a massive name for Bill Smith. So that's actually a fight I could see happening. But then on the flip side of it, if Riviera spoils the party, he's 22-0, and 0, he's got that big name, that's probably going to shoot him up, not necessarily into Jack's positions, but a lot higher. So then again, on the back of a Badu Jack victory, someone like Bill Smith, I think that's a great opponent. No, thank you, thank you very much for that and for your thoughts on this fight. And we're going to, um, I've actually, when, when speaking about it in, in these sort of contexts, you always, it always brings you up more excited and it always sort of teases yeah. out. Initially, when you sit there thinking, 38 year old guy against an unbeaten American guy is a lot younger, could it be a sad spectacle? Would it be a good spectacle? But when you think about it and, and actually, you know, consider it, it actually is probably closer and more of a more of a decent contest than, than initially yeah. credit for. Moving on, we're going to go to Philip Hergovic versus <laughs> Zillow Zhang. Um, this is a heavyweight contest. Um, Hergovic, 14-0, and Zhang, 24-0-1. Now, I think it might be fair in saying Hergovic, in a lot of ways, is one of those guys that's often talked about when you talk about heavyweights, um, sort of the guys beneath the Furies, beneath the Joshua's, beneath the U6, like the guys rising through. He's always a name that's mentioned. But you always look at, also mentioned in the sense of being avoided. Like, you probably look at his his record, and it's got, you know, it's got the likes of Booker, Molina on it. No real yeah. marquee name. Um, necessarily, but not necessarily, there's not his to, to blame him or, or, or to any sort of detriment to, to his negotiating skills in that department. But then the Zhang, 39 years old, um, again, big, tall, rangy guy. Again, not any sort of marquee names necessarily. There's the draw, obviously, with Jerry Forrest on there. This fight really, I mean, I'm going to ask you for, for a prediction on this fight, Owen. I, I think I might know which way you're going to lean, but I'm going to ask you a prediction anyway. <laughs> and then what I'm going to say is, um, depending on your winner, if it's not Zhang, I just wanted to give me give me a kind of summary of where you see Hergovic in the heavyweight division and where you sort of plot out maybe his next two fights, maybe his next three fights, um, considering how the belts are kind of, you know, the Usyk Fury, Usyk Joshua sort of situation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, over to you. Um, well, for a start, Philip Hergovic is a very good friend of uh, ESBR, especially for myself. He gets mentioned so much. He's the fantasy fights, who's next, who do we want to see certain fighters in, Hergovic's name always gets mentioned. And the same with Zhang, to be fair. Um, I think they're both good operators. Um, I was reading earlier today on TalkSport. Um, well, I'm not sure what the substance behind it is. However, they said within the rank, the top 15 rankings of, I believe, I think it was the IBF, no one wanted to fight Hergovic, bar Zhang. Everyone has turned him down. So it is clear to see, you can see from the interviews, the trainer, um, promoter aspects of things no one wants to fight him and I think it's clear to see why he's I think he can box and move not to the likes of an Usyk a Fury he's obviously not that much speed but I think he's got from what I've seen of him I think he packs a lot of power um, I think he packs a big punch um, he's still relatively young in boxing terms um, so I think that's why he's so avoided he's unbeaten he's a serious problem and no one wants to fight him I mean you get fighters who claim they're avoided but it's simple as Hergovic is constantly avoided. No one wants to fight him. And fair play to Zhang. 
I mean, Zhang was in with Joshua in the Olympics um, when Joshua won gold. So you can see why he wouldn't be scared to fight anyone. Um, I do think Hergovic beats him. I think Hergovic has got a slightly better resume. Neither of them have got the huge names you want. Um, so for either fighter, it's, it's a massive win. I think it's, in my opinion, it's the best fight on the undercard. It's probably the closest and the most competitive um, because a lot of people won't have seen much of the two fighters. Um, so when you obviously do your research and people look into it, Hergovic and Beaton, um, Zhang's got a lot of wins. So it, it's an appealing fight. It's one that Hergovic has been talked about getting his big fights for a long, long time now. Um, he's on the big centre stage. And I think I really do think it has the potential to steal the show in a sense. It will be hard to take it away from AJ Nusik. Um, but if Hergovic comes in and dominates Yang um and stops him, it is it's a huge, huge statement. Um so I think I do think Hergovic will win. Um, but I'm just delighted that he's got a decent opponent and someone hasn't been scared to fight him. Um so I'm not sure what your thoughts are, but I think Hergovic for myself. No, yeah, I, I'm backing over it here. I think, like you say, I think he needs he needs like a name almost of Zhang. Statue. Like I know, obviously, Zhang hasn't. You know, it's not with the resume. It's not obviously like fighting someone like a Parker necessarily, or like a Ruiz, or a name of that statue. But he just needs someone to get in the ring with him. And frankly, this is this is good enough. Yeah. And if he does, you know, puts in a dominant performance here, hopefully, we're on the exposure of this undercard as well, and the promotion is obviously going to get. Yeah. Hopefully, he then gets more, I suppose, interest from the sort of casual fan. I mean, he's obviously one of those sort of like dirty little secrets in a way for like boxing fans when you're yeah. talking to casuals and you're going like yeah this guy's a serious issue in this, if this division if anyone wants to fight him um it'd be nice for them to that that exposure to be given and then yeah hopefully hopefully bigger fights and come along the way and i was just thinking because i've been looking obviously again i like to have a sort of look at the rankings like you say obviously everyone's avoided him pretty much through the ibf um and he's ranked actually just benign ortiz who obviously fights ruiz um yeah which is surprising, but I suppose, again, like you say, he hasn't necessarily had the fights um, to push himself further up there. And then even in the WBC rankings, he's down there, actually in 14, below Hunter, um, below the likes of Bacoli, Hellenius. Um, so I was thinking, say, take those names, that are like take out of the equation, Fury, Usyk, AJ. Where do you where do you rate Hergovic? Obviously, you've got other names like Dillian White kicking around still, Joe yeah. Joyce, Bacoli, Otto Wallin. All these sort of named Wilder back on the scene. Like, where do you rate Hergovic's potential against maybe all those other guys? If you're if you're taking sort of a top ten ranking, um, at present, I'd say lower. Probably, I would say he's probably top fifteen, but we're probably talking fifteenth just. But potential wise, dependent on how he gets through against Zhang, I think he'll definitely be a top ten heavyweight. Um, I think both of them could still be a top ten heavyweight. Um, it's just. It's just that whole boxing cliche, you know, getting someone to fight them. Um, it is hard when you're an avoided fighter. We've seen it with so many fighters in the past who people just want to see them fight, but they just don't happen. A lot, obviously, we don't get to see behind the scenes, so it's good when promoters um, come out and say it and when they do interviews and do say, look, no, literally no one wants to fight me. It's out there in the public. It's almost like an outcry of someone take the fight. I need to fight. I need to make my name sort of thing. Um, so I do think he'll definitely will be a top 10 heavyweight, Hergovic. Um, Zhang, I think he'll he'll flirt around with the top 15. Um, I don't think he'll win any titles. Um, whereas I think Hergovic is sort of, it's still a bit unknown. It's expected, you know, he's got a decent amateur pedigree. Um, and then as he's come into the pro ranks, he, he clearly packs a punch um, and he moves quite well. So he's got everything you'd want in a heavyweight. Um, and there's clearly a reason why he's so avoided um, by all the top fighters. Um, so, yeah, he'll definitely be top 10. Um, it's just how fast he can get there. I think it's going to be quite a slow process, especially if he bombs Zhang out. Then, it, although it should speed it up, I think it'll slow it down. No, I, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to this fight. I agree, I agree with you, actually, in some ways. It's almost like there's a lot of intrigue in this fight because... It's been a while since he's obviously seen Hergovic, and this is like potentially the breakout fight for him. So yeah, this is this is one I'm definitely looking forward to. And in many ways, I agree with you. I think this is actually the fight of the undercard. But not saying anything away from my next fight, which is going to be fight this up at light heavy, which is Callum Smith versus Matthew Borderleague, which I believe 
Um, again, looking at the uh, looking at the rankings, is obviously World Elite being um, two rank behind Smith for the WBC title, of which the champion is Arta Bitabayev. So this is obviously a guy who is highly ranked. Who comes into this into this context, twenty one one and zero. Uh, Callum Smith, obviously twenty eight one and zero. Um, coming off the back of losing to losing to Canelo up at Super Middle, down at Super Middle, sorry, and then obviously coming that impressive victory against uh, Castillo, who was obviously taken twelve rounds by by Bivol. Um, whether or not, I suppose, I argue that Bivol's not necessarily a KO uh, specialist or not, is irrespective. They're still very good to get him out of their second mm. round. Um, so this fight, Owen, um, obviously Callum Smith campaigning, obviously now a new weight, um, stepping up against a guy who's highly ranked, uh, one of the governing bodies. Can I just get your take on on a prediction here, please? Um, I was quite surprised actually when I was looking at Border League's sort of his record. Um, I mean, I know he got I think it's bronze in the Olympics, so he, he's got a, a perfect amateur pedigree in a sense. Um, if you get an Olympic bronze medal, you, you're a fantastic amateur. Um, he hasn't done much in the pro ranks really, he's fought a lot of a lot of French fighters. Um, he got knocked out, he got TKO'd, sorry, by some unknown Italian, um, I've never heard of. Had a look through some of his uh, fights, found some highlights, and he he weren't much really. Um, and obviously he stopped board leak. Um, he's thirty three now, so this for being his first sort of known um, fight on such a big platform, it's his first chance and his last chance really. Um, if he beats Smith, the name Smith holds, ex world champion, um, had more than one bout, super series winner. Um, so if if he can gain the scalp over Smith, then that his his sort of um, the, I, don't, I don't know how to put it like he'll, it boosts him up within the rankings massively, um, and I know it's likely to lead to a title shot sooner or later. But it, it's weird like he's still relatively unknown, but he's got a big scalp, so he'll get bigger fights. But it's a question of he'll he beats if he beats Smith. He probably gets stopped in a world title fight. If he beats Smith, for me, it's a lucky punch or it's a bad night for Smith. Um, I think Callum has to come through this convincingly. Um, I know a loss to Canelo is no shame at all, but if he struggles up at a new weight, it's never a good sign in your first fight. Um, I do think he needs to not. He doesn't necessarily need to stop him. I just think he needs to be comfortable, show what he can do. Um, and then it's like it's an eliminator. So whether he gets a title shot next, the WBC is by far, in my opinion, the most political bout. Um, so God knows if he'll actually get the shot next. I mean, obviously at light heavy, you've got Bivol still around the weight. Um, he needs to decide what he's doing. Um, Canelo still seems to be wanting the light heavy. And obviously we saw what happened with Canelo and Smith. So it's it's an intriguing one. Um, because obviously Border League stock will be massive if he wins whereas Smith if he wins convincingly great if he struggles through it's questions raised again Um, so I I do see Smith beating him rather comfortably I think it'll be points I mean Smith showed he's got power on on, on the odd occasion Um, but I I think it'll be a points victory for Smith Um, I I think I want to throw you mentioned there obviously about obviously there's He's mm-hmm. from Bivol as the champions in the division. Um, say Smith does come through convincingly. Obviously, there's there's a likelihood, I suppose, that he would be in for a shot at the WBC title held by Peter Bayer. But I was also going to say, out of those two champions, do you do you give him what sort of chance do you give him coming through and becoming a world champion in this division? Do you think it's something that can happen while these two are the champions, or is he almost going to have to wait potentially until until one of them <laughs> either vacates or retires or whatever? I hate to say it because he's British, you know, he's a Smith brother. Um, he's already done a lot for boxing in this country, the Super Series, the titles, etc. But whilst Paterbiev and Bivol are around, I don't even think he gets a sniff. Um, I think Bivol stops him. No, sorry, I think Bivol beats him um, on points and I think Paterbiev stops him and I think Paterbiev hurts him. Um, I hate to say it like say because he is British and I'd love Smith to be able to be a two weight world champion. I just think Bivol's too good for him. The way Bivol beat Canelo and the way Canelo was against Smith, I, I just don't think that's a good fight stylistically for him at all. I think in terms of styles, Paterbiev's the better one if he can keep him at bay, keep him at range. Because I'd imagine Smith's huge, even for light heavy still. 
I mean, uh, super middle, he was ridiculously big. Um, so he's still a decent size at the weight. And Baterbiev isn't the tallest. Um, obviously, anyone who watched Baterbiev knows he's got freakish power. Um, and he's just, he's just brilliant at what he does. He dismantles opponents. Um, but I think stylistically, that's probably the better matchup. But I really don't think Smith keeps him at bay for the full 12. And I think once Baterbiev catches him, it's lights out. Um, I don't know whether you give him a chance, but personally, whilst them two are still in the division or around, it's no chance for me. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's it's a no for me, frankly. I think um, it's a tough one with Smith because in a way, you've obviously got victories against like Groves. You come through WBSS title, the sorry tournament. You come through that, but then almost, obviously, we know the contentious fight with Ryder. Then the way the kind of, I mean, no one, you know, obviously Canelo's, Canelo's obviously an elite fighter. The way that that sort of fight played out and the performance again was quite disappointing, especially when you compare it to how Saunders fought. Even though you know you sort of you're not you're stopped, the way he sort of went out on his shield and was having a bit more success, uh, despite not having the physical advantages of Smith, um, was a bit disappointing. So I think in a way, for me, in a way, it's like I agree with you. I don't think I don't think the world title route for for Smith is actually going to be the one that's going to bear fruition. What I'd like to see, and what I'm actually going to get your opinion on now, actually, because I was thinking about it when you were talking about it, and we can finish on a a joyous. Uh, British segment is whether out of those guys, the British guys in that division. So obviously you've got Bratzi, you've got uh, Yard, you've got Smith, Callum Johnson still kicking around. Do you have Smith as the best of those guys? A light heavy on the British scene, or is there? Oh, are you more of a fan, or do you believe that one of the other guys has got more potential um, than Callum Smith up at this weight? Um, I think it's a bit of a weird one. I think at present, I'd probably say Smith's the best boxer. Um, technically, I'd, I'd say he's comfortably the best. Um, Boatsy's a weird one. Um, as I said to you, yourself and the guys earlier today, from his first pro, his debut, from his first pro fight, it was he was earmarked, and I completely agreed with it. I was like, Joshua Boatsy will be a world champion, but I think his progress has been extremely slow because he, he started off quite fast. They were moving him through the ranks, sort of thing, stepping up his opponents nicely, and then he didn't look amazing in his last fight. Um, did turn into a bit of a dog fight. Um, sort of halfway through. Um, so with Buatzi, I don't think Buatzi wins a world title. I think Smith beats him. Um, it's again, it's a weird one because although Smith's a better boxer than Callum Johnson, I could actually see Callum Johnson stopping Smith if they ever fought. Um, and the way um, Johnson was in his world title fight, I see Johnson as being the most likely because of his power. He's clearly got the power. He can knock anyone out. Um, you know, dropping a world champion um, in the four or five rounds, whichever it was, it was around that mark, was, it was just mental. It was just straight into each other um, and it was quite brutal. So I don't see Anthony Yard winning the world title. I, I do see Callum Johnson being the one based off his power alone, really. He's had one chance um, and he showed that he can clearly punch um, with the, the best punchers in the division. Um, whereas I just see sort of Yard would get stopped, I think. Um, I don't think he's got... I don't know whether it's Tundi or Jai, um, but I just don't think Yard's got that killer instinct. Like when he fought Kovalev, he should have jumped on Kovalev. It should have been all over him more than he was and empty the gas tank sooner when Kovalev was hurt. So whether Yard has that killer instinct, the same with the Lyndon Arthur, the first fight. Um, so out, out of those... I'd probably say, based off ability, you'd say Smith is the best, but I think Callum Johnson would be the most likely to bring the title in. And what about yourself? Uh, that's actually very interesting. I think um, I, the thing is, before you said that, I wasn't thinking that way. But now, now you're talking about Callum Johnson, I actually, <laughs> I can actually see that happening. I was kind of agree with you. I think that Smith, at the stage that he's at and the abilities he's at, is probably well, before we started. I was thinking was, was the best of those of those yeah. four guys. But then, like you say, like I almost feel like Boatsy, like we've seen, I feel like he's been within himself. Like you say, he hasn't seemed to have kicked on to the level you'd expect him to kick on. But at the same time, I kind of expect him to be able to find a different level at some point. Um, yeah. Anthony Yard, I think, is a weird one. It's that sense of like, oh, the first Lyndon Arthur fight, like you haven't turned up. I know you had obviously a lot of personal problems and a lot of things, his personal life outside. Yeah. In the ring there, but then you look at like the rematch. I'm mean, sitting there thinking you should be dispatching people of like of you know of Arthur's calibre if you want to be a world champion. 
and then comes in the oh. second fight and 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 you know now that played out so in a weird way it's with him it's like i don't know who's gonna turn up on the night but i do think when it comes up against those other guys i almost feel like smith would be too big for him in a way and like to just just outbox him yeah um well, actually, I'll back him to beat him as well. But actually, I actually quite like the Callum Johnson shout, to be honest with you, just like stopping stopping Smith just by pure power and pure style. And I just feel like it's one of those guys as well where you just kind of willing him on. Like, one, I, just, I feel like he needs, he deserves another shot, to be honest. So that sort of willed yeah. years where you're sort of going, you performed well against, you know, Peter Bayer, and you just, then you're sort of almost doing nothing. You're almost just like, you know, fighting kind of people that no one's heard of. So it's almost that sense of, I just want to, I just want to see him get another shot, whether it's a bivol or a rematch. Either either one I'd be happy with. So yeah, I'm 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 happy to agree and to sign off your shout the captain <laughs> Johnson now before before prevail. Um, but that takes us, I think, obviously to to a certain segment where we've obviously completed the the undercar preview. But I just wanted Owen before um before I wrap up and give a word to our uh, to our sponsors etc. Um, can if there's any other final thoughts that you have um about the about the event in general or the undercard or yeah anything anything further you'd like to add? I think the only thing I'd like to add really is. Tyrone Spong fighting. When I saw that pop up, I didn't think it was serious. Um, and then when I seen it, I was thinking, he's actually he's actually got a, a tough fight there. Um, I was sort of looked at it and I was like, there's there's no way Tyrone Spong's fighting. And then when I seen um, who he's fighting, and I looked through his record and I was like, he's he's only lost to do- um I can't say his first name. He's only lost to Dortikos who went 12 rounds with Bradis and got stopped by Gassiev and has actually beat Steve Cunningham. So when I saw Tyrone Sprong fighting, I was like, <laughs> all right, this is this is a bit weird. <laughs> and then when I seen his opponent, was like 19 and 1, and the only loss was to Dortikos. I think it's <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Tabiti, that's who's fighting, sorry. Um, so when I saw Tabiti's only loss was to Dortikos, I was like, Spong could get seriously hurt here. He been, <laughs> it'll be, I think it's over three years he hasn't been in the ring. Um, Tabiti's coming in on the back of a, a good win as well. Um, and yeah, I'm just generally, I'm, I'm not sure about yourself, but I'm just genuinely baffled that Tyrone's <laughs> still a heavyweight boxer and is actually fighting on this card. Well, before before we go, I mean, I have to take your you. I agree with you on the kind of surprise factor of this fight. But I was going to take your actual prediction. Do you think Tabiti with the pedigree will come through Spong, or do you think yeah, there's? I think I think he knocks him out. You can't deny Spong's kickboxing. You know, glory K one. Um, his kickboxing record's phenomenal. He's an unbelievable kickboxer. He's never really got going in the heavyweights. He's been out of the ring for three years, and he's fighting Tabiti, whose last fight. Don't quote me on the exact date, but it was May this year. Um, and he's knocked out his last two opponents. One was a knockout and one was a TKO. So I just think it's just going to be a disaster for Spong. <laughs> I mean, if he comes through and if he beats him, it, it, it could be a boring fight. It could be a Spong knockout. You know, the heavyweights, anything can happen. But personally, I just I just can't see anything other than a Tabiti knockout. No, I, I, I agree with you. I almost think it's one of those ones where it's not quite... The breadth not, was not quite the sort of Jake Paul Rahman Jr. kind of um, breadth. Yeah. But he was sitting there going, this is also quite bizarre. Um, I'd expect, obviously, to be easy to come through it. But um, I'd like to say, firstly, thank you, Owen, uh, for going through. Obviously, we're taking you guys through there through some, obviously, some undercar fights in, in greater detail. Join, obviously... Um, I suppose join join the boxing world on, on Saturday, uh, the 20th of August. Um, to join also, you know, Yusik, Joshua and the guys we've mentioned, obviously, for the event over in Saudi Arabia. And again, if you want to watch it, just click on the link below in the description. Um, and yeah, we hope to hope to give you some, well, some more content coming up, obviously, from us guys. Uh, you know, we've got obviously predictions, uh, written and video, um, various fighter interviews coming out, various other previews going out. So check out the channel for those. Um, and then obviously, there'll certainly be some review content when I think, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to end on any, well, on a negative, but it won't be negative for me. But I think we'll have some reviews obviously of Utix victory and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go from there agreed, so Owen, thank you very much and uh, thank you again guys for watching pleasure as always